Hello everyone, this is Amit from Harbinger Systems. Welcome to the webinar and greetings for the day. We are going to be starting in just a minute. I'm just hoping that if anybody is trying to join in and is still taking time towards software installation, etc. Uh, but in the meantime, I will introduce you to the panel. We have with us today Subodh, Umesh, Prachi and myself. Subodh, Umesh and Prachi are all technical leads in our office. They are the ones who lead various software technology practices and have been leading the mobile technology initiative within Harbinger Group. And we have implemented various such solutions where they have been instrumental in not only defining software solutions but also designing those and helping them develop various kinds of complete solutions on, on mobility. So welcome everyone. Hello Subodh. Hello Umesh. I think Prachi is not going to be able to join in. And uh, hello, everybody. Let me. Are you? If you are able to hear me, please. Uh, and just let me know if there's any problem on chat, or and you can ask questions on the on the question section in the uh, go to meeting webinar uh, window that you see on the right side of your screen. You can put your questions there at the end of the presentation and the webinar. Also, we will be having a Q and A where. Uh, where we can take those questions and answer those. So thank you everyone for your patience. Let me move on and start the webinar now. And uh, Subodh and Umesh would be taking up all the technical questions. Our webinar today is based on various experiences that we have had when we have been working with customers across the world, uh, both startups as well as multiple end user organizations within uh, various large corporations where they have taken mobility as one of the solutions to go forward. Startups because they had been talking of mobility as a solution to take to the market and that was their revenue model going forward. Our experiences with customers as well as prospects and various peers in the industry has been that uh, there are various stages that a corporation, that a company, that an entrepreneur goes through and there are seldom any guidelines or framework that a person can look at to understand what the market is going to be needing, how they are going to be developing this solution, how the wish list is going to turn up into actually the, uh, the, the individual app stores of either Android or iOS and, and likewise. So not taking any further time. I would like uh, Umesh and Subodh to please take the question in terms of why is it that we really need this webinar today? Why are we having it? Thanks, Amit. Uh, this is Umesh. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so mobile has been um, the topmost technology trend uh, in recent times and uh, majority uh, the driving factors of all the consumers and the enterprise uh, market apps now. And uh, every new product uh, is now uh, considering mobile strategy in their roadmap. But the mobile first is now really getting the larger consumer base um, and the overall viral spread of uh, your brand earlier to the consumer. And uh, uh, I mean, as recent as yesterday, uh, there was a, a report from IDC uh, that was uh, more of a revealing news across the web, uh, which stated that the developers or the startups see a big potential to topple Facebook-like uh, apps by having the mobile first uh, social uh, startup apps. And uh, really, the mobile has the power to reshape the entire industry quickly. And how, how, how does uh, this um, affect the startups? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the report also indicated uh, about by 2015, uh, it's more likely that this mobility trend would be more even stronger and there could be opportunities beyond just the smartphones and tablets. So for the startups, uh, staying competitive isn't simply a matter of uh, porting the elements of an existing business model to mobile, but rather it requires re-envisioning uh, the traditional business model to, uh, to a new mobile lane. So, Umesh, I understand that you talked about mobile first and how does it affect the startups, but 
can you can you give some some examples absolutely uh, i think the uh, most common names are uh, the pinterest uh, which is like a online pin board uh, or maybe the foursquare uh, the location based social networking site all these went with mobile first strategies uh, to build the full brand and the consumer attractions and um, these are more like 30 second apps which you know people are contributing very quickly and having that productivity and interest uh, shared very quickly online and having that viral spread immediately. Uh, Facebook later on went with the mobile and now it's 50% of these their users are mobile app users so it's like already in million uh, those are using the Facebook app. Uh, we have also experience with our customers also. Um, uh, just to give example, um, the uh, food ordering app uh, with one of the uh, the, uh, the ISV who was planning uh, the automation of a process uh, for a largest uh, food chain um, in US uh, went with the mobile first strategy, which enabled the overall process improvement in the placing of. Uh, orders by the consumers and uh, it completely changed the way uh, uh, the way the stores are operating and uh, reduce the overall uh, you know consumer piling up the long queues at the takeaway counters uh, while selecting different combinations of you know foods and so on and now they are just placing order uh, are making their uh, you know standard orders on the go and just you know have that um, uh, payment done through the mobiles and uh, get uh, get their orders at the counters very quickly. Yeah. That's great. That that kind of brings me to my next question. If at all these are the business decisions and for our audience today as well as the customers that we serve and we are about to start serving in the next couple of weeks, what is it that is driving these business decisions? So um Basically, what we have done is we have uh, classified all these decisions into five main categories. So the first one is the goals that are required for a mobile solution, and uh, and basically, so what it uh, says is that what kind of a revenue stream are you expecting from the mobility solution? Is it like a continuous source of revenue? Is it uh, that you want to sell content through the mobile application or is the mobile application only meant to attract attention of your end user or is it like an enabler for other services that you might have and the mobile platform is uh, going to motivate more and more users to start participating or the goal for mobility is just to build a differentiator when it comes to competition. So the goal for mobility can be quickly distinguished among these four main points. And the next category of business decisions is about market trends. Now this is something which is very important um, for a startup to look at. So under market trend, one needs to analyze how fast is the user base of that particular domain shifting towards the mobile solution. Like is it moving very quickly or is it moving at a slow pace or does it need some kind of a push? Then what kind of platform and manufacturers are making use in the particular domain in which the startup might be planning to deploy a mobile solution? And the third category is about competition. So startups usually do get into competitive situations and um, this point is all about analyzing what kind of solution do the competitors have. Like, is the startup going to be catching up with them or do they want to create a strong differentiator in the market by being the first to come up with a mobility solution. Then the next item about is in the category is about time to market. So how sooner or how later should the solution be launched to general public? Is it meant to grab any seasonal attention? So uh, in the coming slides, we'll take a look at some of the good practices that can help startups quickly bring their applications up to speed and take them to the market on time. 
so that they can achieve their uh, mobility goals. And finally, the fifth and last um, item on the decisions part is the ROI, which is of course the most important thing. So what kind of an ROI is the startup going to expect from its mobility solution? So ROI, it kind of sums up everything. So towards the end of this presentation, again, we have an in-depth slide which talks about the return on investment the uh, organization can get from the mobile solution. Great. So, so this helps us understand a lot in terms of what is affecting these market decisions. Why are our customers going to do that and how can how can you be of any help? Uh, any such vendor can be of help who understands what it takes uh, to be able to understand the business need of a certain ISV or an end user customer who wants a partner who will be able to work with them, walk with them and deliver to them what they want. So this is great. Let me move on and ask you another question. What is it that affects product design and definition for mobility? This is important because I think everybody would be wanting to understand in terms of now how, now, now how will the solution move forward. We have understood what it takes, we understood why it is required, what will help the business need now, what is it that will affect the product design and definition. Right. Uh, so, uh, when, uh, first of all, your, your product idea is catering to certain verticals of the domain and keeping the uh, uh, respective end users in your mind and uh, the app could be, uh, you know, the travel or gaming or sports or any other social flavor app, which are consumer apps, uh, or it may have a healthcare retail e-commerce still consumer having some enterprise systems linked with it. Um, considering these aspects, uh, you need to define uh, how the overall um, user experience you are targeting and really targeting that goal for mobility through the uh, products or the services that are offered in those verticals. Uh, and it could be the, the platform that may need to you know, target first. Uh, we, we already seen uh, like iOS picking up stronger with their security uh, and eating uh, BlackBerry market share uh, in the enterprise space as well. Uh, and when you are trying to reach to more masses, I think Android having the largest share right now uh, to go with uh, uh, apps which are widely used. So similarly, uh, you need to also, I think Subodh uh, already talked about the competition, how uh, how your decisions can affect uh, looking at the similar offerings from the competitors. And having a unique differentiator or unique offering always keeps you ahead. Uh, uh, just, just for example, the Foursquare where uh, having that uh, the first time that location-based um, networking uh, was not affected even though Facebook came with its places kind of features as well. Uh, similarly, uh, the way uh, we, we get the advantages over computer with this differentiator, uh, we also get benefited with the, the way we get partnership from the other uh, sources to uh, have more end-to-end -end product offering as well as uh, uh, some of the advantages over the competition as well. Uh, some of the examples that we work with our customers, they had a great partnership in terms of uh, getting the, uh, the back-end details or the services linked with their product. Uh, for example, uh, a travel itinerary planner app uh, had several partners for providing the content related to the travel attractions and the full uh, you know, reservation systems linked with it across the globe. Uh, or the, the example that I talked about, the food ordering app had types with different coupon services uh, for their local promotion uh, to be uh, delivered and get more consumers attracted to use the services. Um, similarly, other product definitions or the designs are even driven by the latest technology trends. And uh, definitely the mobile itself is a big trend uh, but within that, it is rapidly evolving and newer devices, newer versions of OS and uh, rapidly coming with new versions of it, all these capabilities uh, uh, effectively leverage can really add a, um, a, a big 
different dimension to all your product offering. Uh, the augmented reality or some of the the, the hot atoms that we uh, see right now uh, or uh, the trends like uh, uh, currently the second screen applications which enable uh, viewers actually getting um, or commenting and contributing uh, from their applications while they are watching the TV shows. Uh, all these trends are really capturing and uh, everybody is trying to uh, get ahead on those uh, set of features to get the customers attracted to it. And uh, by planning all these aspects and all these parameters, uh, we definitely need to depend on uh, multiple uh, sources of information. Uh, you need to make those enablers through different, connecting to different platforms and services. And uh, you need to ensure that what you are building is the set of interfaces or in technical terms we call it APIs uh, to be exposed and linked and extend these functionalities by working with your partners and their technology systems. And uh, often these are uh, you know, designed as even API first kind of approach and uh, take it, taking it ahead to the next level of uh, its implementation. All right, so that's pretty self-explanatory by itself. Uh, but then this all leads to ultimately what are the likely revenue models for both for each mobility-based for the mobility-based solutions? Mish, would you like to answer that? Because sure. Sure, this is going to be another interesting area that customers would be interested in, and audience would like to know what are the likely revenue models for these. True. Um, Definitely, I mean, that's a very critical aspect. Uh, we often see this uh, dilemma of free versus paid. Uh, the, the, obviously, the, the paid is where uh, you are getting um, uh, revenue from the number of downloads and the app consumption, uh, which also has uh, another set of uh, modes like in-app purchase, uh, where you are also offering some of the products or services purchased within the application. Uh, or it could be an uh, application which is really distributed as well, uh, which can leverage um, the in-app advertisement or other advertisement related networking. Uh, so, uh, so the realization of your ROI could be in multiple forms. So either it could be uh, the, the services that you are offering are getting next to the next level. Uh, it could be the content-based uh, uh, revenue, or it could be the whole lot of data that you are trying to generate from the mobile or the consumers of application, uh, which is, uh, I mean, being uh, as considered as uh, most hot trend right now, uh, and uh, giving you know in multiple times than the just the app value. Uh, the, so some of the other examples could be the real-time updates which are uh, helping you take faster decisions and thus uh, improve the efficiency or it can help you increase the access to the services that you are really offering and thus increase your customer base or reduce the average travel costs required and the time required and thus save uh, money on it or decrease the overall work backlog and the whole process improvement and automation and so on. So your realization of the entire uh, ROI uh, could be in any of such forms. Cool. And I understand now. I mean, if I was to summarize, I would think that there are multiple ways to generate interest on the ROI by having your revenue models fixed or based on the various ideas that you spoke about. But now, once the money starts to come in and uh, customers know how to make that revenue meet uh, with their projected goals, uh, the question would be how would you go about developing these solutions? There, there has to be some kind of a fixed approach which is more or less known to people in terms of what would be the step one, the step two, the step three, and so that people have an idea in terms of not going on a wild goose chase, 
but really knowing in terms of on a very broad level what is it that they are going to be knowing. So the entire development process can be thought of as three, I wouldn't say easy, but three steps which need to be followed. Step number one is called as foundation. So uh, what it means is that you build a robust, expendable, flexible core for your application so that your application can sustain any kind of user loads for any number of duration and can cater to different individual requirements or if you uh, bag in a big customer same core can also serve that customer while serving the other end users. So building a robust core which is in the form of either the mobile application or the server side that's going to serve that mobile app, uh, it all comes under the robustness of the core. The next step is once your core is ready is to start working on integration. Now integrations can be classified in two types. The first one is social integration with uh, the well-known social networks, the ad networks and so on. But importantly, uh, many startups would benefit by partnering with different service providers so that they can reach to their goals very quickly. Because if you start to build something all by yourself, it's going to take a lot of time. But there are service providers who give uh, information at a fixed cost or for free of charge uh, assuming that you credit them on your site. The biggest example is uh, uh, a company that provides you uh, Google information or analytical information about different websites and it gives a layer on top of a map. So that can be, a, uh, that can be an example of partner integration. And similarly, social integration also makes your app and platform more famous, more popular among different users and user sets. And the third step in building this platform is expansion. So once your core is ready, once you have integrated with different partners and social networks, you can now start thinking of expanding your mobility solution to span across multiple platforms. So assuming you start from iOS, you can then start thinking about Android. You can immediately start thinking about Windows 8 because that is something which is around the corner and everyone is eagerly looking forward for that. And of course, once you have different platforms coming into picture, they also get along with them the different form factors. Are you building, do you want to expand your mobility solution to go from a mobile phone to tablets to, and, or to Android based television sets and so on. So the form factors kind of increase. And this kind of forms an iterative cycle. So once you have expanded, you again can come back and modify your core so that it can now cater to higher and better demands. So, in short, all the, the entire process of building such a solution can be classified into three discrete steps. So that's great. So, so you were saying that if I was to develop a mobile application which caters to the travel industry or a banking industry or to the hospitality industry, would you think that these remain unchanged, the foundation, the integrations, and the expansion, these three iterative, iterative steps? Yes, definitely. So if you take an example of a travel industry based solution. So uh, assume that it's a mobile application that gives you more information about the well-known uh, places to visit in a particular city. So the core of this particular solution comprises of the database of all the places that you need to visit then the different API calls that you might need to make with the uh, individual websites those places of attraction might have. So once the core is ready, then now you can make your application so famous by putting uh, posts on Facebook, by tweeting whenever you use that application. Similarly, uh, you might partner with some of the local search providers who might uh, give you a better deal if their results are populated higher in your travel app. And then once your app is ready, say for iOS, and you feel that you want to attract or you want to take your solution into a geography where um, Android is more popular than iOS, then you can take the same solution and build a mobile app around uh, Android 
And similarly, if Windows 8 is going to be the next big thing that's going to happen to the mobile world, then you can be ready ahead of time just by leveraging whatever you have done in the first two steps. All right. That, that's great. And, and thanks, because I had that question specifically in mind. And that's why I asked it. Now, now, since now we now we know in terms of what's the market, how to get there, what is required to develop these solutions, how to make it good, what all to make sure to be put, to put in the solution, how to make it iterative, what kind of frameworks can one expect, etc. Now, how do our audience that has joined us today, and thank you again all of you for joining in. How would you, the audience, reach to the market? There are timeline questions. Now, for example, uh, I know somebody who's developing actually an hospitality industry app, and they want to be able to release the app on the uh, app on the iTunes Store by uh, uh, Christmas, and and that's what barely three months away, which is very 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 short time, and then the pressures on timeline will be immense. How how would the audience get to something like that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's in, uh, I would say, two-fold uh, perspective. One is business and the other is the technical uh, aspects around it. Uh, from the business point of view, uh, uh, you need, need to, uh, you know, keep the goal for mobility uh, always in front of you and um, align your product roadmap very clearly and really plan the boundaries of uh, what all you need for your release 1.0 and have that definition very uh, great. Uh, you often get dragged or um, uh, attracted towards, you know, including multiple set of features which are probably nice to have, uh, but it may uh, deviate you and probably lose uh, really uh, getting and losing that opportunity uh, to reach to your consumer. Uh, just for example, I and mean, if you are targeting for an event, uh, the main goal is to get the as much as registration from the uh, consumer uh, than you know capturing further data and so on or other enhancement. Uh, so uh, you know getting the, the product out earliest to ensure and getting uh, prior to those events uh, is much more important than uh, getting into the other set of uh, nice to have features. Uh, the uh, I mean, the most of the startups, I think, follow advice of, uh, you know, think big and start small. Uh, so you need to really think from in terms of uh, all the platforms that you would be required to support or all the set of features that you will probably require it, uh, in future and start with a small set of uh, feature sets which are really essential uh, from the single platform. and. Uh, 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 probably designed in such a way that you have common set of components that can be reused across uh, the solution. And uh, we, uh, we probably uh, also need some of the services and the libraries that can be reused across as well as uh, plan uh, ahead of time so that, um, as Subodh indicated, having that robust core is probably the first foundation step that you probably would follow. And um, all the frameworks uh, and the automation for the test cycles also helps you. Uh, the uh, best practices uh, to toward the stores approval also will uh, ensure that you don't have to get into the iterative uh, submission process. Uh, and sometimes it may fall back on your uh, the um, design decisions which are taken at the early stages and may uh, impact the entire time to market uh, plan. So ensure that uh, you have a team of experts to certify your app at every stage, uh, which will ensure your app is adhering to the store guidelines as well. This, this is great and, and thank you, Mish, because I know that I was working with one of the healthcare non-profit companies and they wanted to have an Android app which would basically sit on their tablet devices mm -hmm. and that people would be able to play with it when they, when they release it for demonstration purposes at an event. It was a healthcare event 
they gave us exactly a three and a half week timeline. And this framework is what helped us in terms of that, that we talked about in terms of how do you go from step one to two to three to be able to envisage what is required. After that, what helped us was to understand the roadmap in terms of what is it that is required in the end. Instead of populating it with a lot of unnecessary features, we fixed ourselves on a limited number of feature sets. We made sure that the UI was attractive and we went with that and we realized that by the time we were we finished, we were ahead of schedule and we could do it within three and a half weeks, which was a big thing by itself. And it is just to say that because we are ready with such framework and such a mindset that you just explained about in terms of aligning the product roadmap, understanding what all cross-platform technologies are going to be required, what common technologies would be used, frameworks reused, various libraries that can be reused, that helps us get to the store readiness pretty quickly. So I think I am I am and I'm coming towards the end of the webinar, and uh, I will throw the the session open to everyone to to ask questions in the question section of the webinar window on the right side of your of your screen. It would really help us to know in terms of what your questions are, and we will try to answer those over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, but while you are writing these questions, please allow me to thank you for having for having heard us out and and paying attention. Uh, I will while you are typing your questions, I will just go through each slide quickly and mute myself so that you can you can think about some questions and write those down. Uh, thank you, May. Thank you to both. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just run through the slides in mute so that they can capture the whole uh, thought process.
Thank you, everyone. And uh, we have a, a number of questions, and all of them seem interesting. So what I'll do is I will go one by one in terms of how we receive them. And one of the uh, attendees today asked, let's say I put all efforts to build some mobile application, but realize that some other company has come up with almost the same application ahead of me in the market. What should be my take now, as I'm only one or two months away from releasing my product? So um, I think thank you very much for this question. Um, it is a uh, it is something that would happen in a real time market. So uh, the first and foremost thing is if this application has already been released, then um, one needs to sit with that application and analyze how it is similar or different to the application that you are trying to build. Uh, if you feel that it is exactly similar, then and if you really want to not uh, redesign that app, then what you need to ensure that uh, the features that you are providing are better in terms of usability, in terms of the content, in terms of performance, and so on, as compared to the other application. And of course, if uh, uh, the features that are indeed different from what you have uh, uh, what you have analyzed and you need to ensure that whatever features your app has are indeed the USP of the solution and are not kind of add-on so it's more of a business decision to analyze but um, on the technology front I think the saving grace is that you can ensure that uh, from a usability from a performance from a bug free feature your application is superior to this competitive app that's already been released. Thank you, Zubal. Here's another question from, from another of our uh, guests today. What is the main platform or variety of those that you recommend to develop such mobile applications? Okay. Um, thank you again for this question. Uh, so there are different criteria that one needs to analyze before figuring out what platforms um, should be used for mobile application. One of the factors is the geography in which that app is going to be used or the solution is going to be used. For example, if it is the US market, then obviously iPhone and iPad based solutions are more popular. If it is, uh, say, the African market, then maybe uh, Symbian based solutions are more popular. If it is Europe or um, Asia, then probably it's a mixture. So that's factor number one that one needs to decide on. The other factor is the audience or the users of the application itself. So if it is an application that is more of a fun or social and it's going to be popular um, amongst teenagers, then probably uh, teenagers most likely use Android based platforms. If the application is meant for corporate or business type of um, users, then BlackBerry might be a better solution to build the uh, solution. If uh, the organization for which the app is being built, if they have legacy Windows based systems, then a Windows platform is more suited. So considering all these uh, criteria, if these are studied well and put together, uh, a priority list of platforms can be determined. And uh, that can help build the roadmap because you don't want to uh, develop apps for all platforms and at the end find out that, okay, one particular platform is getting all the hits, whereas the other apps are just being uh, kept idle. So putting all these criteria together can give a good answer to uh, what platforms should be used. And that's a good input because from my experience talking to various customers, the iOS and Android apps, have always been a requirement for the past couple of years. And I'm starting to see a lot of Windows OS related, the mobile OS related requirements. And with the new Windows 8 coming up, I think uh, the requirements are starting to show that we will have some momentum building towards the Windows platform too. And I would think that the ecosystem is going to exist. And knowing the fact that Android has captured a better market share, uh, there has to be a need to evaluate iOS and Android in equality instead of having a bias against each other. And, and that's just my opinion from what I've been talking to customers about. 
But I understand that if it's in the entertainment industry, people go with the iOS. If it is more towards general use, general use, the and normal game, various kinds of bank and travel related apps, then Android still remains one of the uh, one of the widely used uh, platforms. I will I will ask you another question and and that come from another of the attendees today. What would be an example of a common library? Okay. Um, so often there are common frameworks already available out in the market, which are like PhoneGap, Titanium, Figure.io is the, the latest one. Um, all these offer good um, uh, cross-platform solutions uh, in terms of uh, the technology choice of implementation of beyond native as well. Uh, but when it comes to user experience uh, and the performance of the native technologies are the most preferred ones. And while building such apps, uh, apps using such technologies, you need to account for uh, you know better use and the best practices in terms of uh, the design patterns, the uh, well-factored code, uh, and ensure that uh, building for one platform can easily extend to the next set of platforms very easily. Uh, so the app is built in terms of different layers, like its uh, storage, its network connectivity, its user interface, and so on. And uh, at Harbinger, uh, uh, with our uh, experience over the years, we have built certain set of uh, API libraries and common set of components, uh, which help you uh, leverage that and quickly and uh, efficiently build such uh, functionality. For example, for the network um, layer, we have these HTTP service or storage service or cache or pre cache uh, services and the overall API service interfaces, which will help you uh, quickly build a loosely coupled interfaces in those layers. Or it could be consuming of third party services like Facebook or ad network or uh, analytic services, or which you can uh, build those interfaces and easily uh, replicate it for the different set of other uh, uh, partners or vendors or replace uh, by another one very easily. So such libraries can really help you uh, build faster, efficient and those are well tested code sets. Uh, so uh, it helps in terms of quality as well. Thanks. Um, yes, that, that's good because I understand that libraries are important. But here's the question. Now, and, and this is a direct question to Harbinger that one of the attendees has asked. You have stressed on time to market. What is Harbinger's experience when it comes to app submissions? Oh, okay. Um, so app submission is a uh, completely different uh, experience as compared to uh, just building the app. Uh, since the publisher is an um, external entity that plays a role in this process, um, a lot depends on how quickly does the publisher respond to or uh, how normally a submission takes is 24 to 48 hours kind of a, uh, approval time. Um, we have seen this Apple store more of a manual and people driven process as well. So our best experiences with Apple store is that uh, apps have been approved in the span of like 20 hours and during six months it isn't reviewers usually go on vacation and as a result the application may take nearly two weeks get reviewed and it's a uh, varied experience and uh, many times we have uh, uh, you know uh, driven certain decisions in terms of planning those roadmaps to the customers or designing the apps as well uh, based on our experience that what will get approved what will not be get approved and how your um, purchase mechanisms should be and uh, uh, probably what you are offering in your website and what you are planning in your app and there is a uh, quite stronger comment from Apple in terms of what the set of uh, uh, you know features that you should exclusively uh, have it within the app uh, irrespective of your current web portal offering. Okay, so, so that's good again and thank you because I, I, I think Harbinger's experience on app submission is important for us to be able to answer. And here is some some other questions, and uh, I know that we are now going to be slowly running off the clock. But a couple of last questions that I wanted to ask from the from the audience here. 
is to what extent will a cloud-based environment affect the product design? Uh, surely, I think uh, the in recent times, I think the two uh, major technology trends, uh, the cloud and the big data, are uh, really uh, uh, taking the industry to the next level of uh, computing. And um, cloud has uh, uh, specifically enabled uh, the overall distribution uh, and uh, deployment scenario. Uh, so now with the mobility, uh, your devices, uh, I, I think this is the era of you know, every user having multiple devices. And uh, syncing your information from one device to another is really getting pain, uh, which cloud is uh, definitely making a big difference in terms of uh, having uh, your own uh, storage or the, the iCloud kind of offering where uh, all your data is uh, centrally uh, located and all your devices are always synced with the latest of uh, information across devices. And, um, many of the content and publisher strategies uh, or even data-driven applications are leveraging uh, such cloud capabilities for uh, easy access, um, quick synchronization, as well as uh, in terms of uh, distribution of uh, content and uh, media content very effectively over the cloud platform. Okay, so, so again, once again, those answers are good. And I have, I have some questions which are very, very typical. And uh, so I would be taking those offline with the, with the audience directly. And I, just for the sake of what the audience kind of has asked for, I will, I will just repeat the question. One of them is, what is the start of success in India? And uh, I will write to you separately and take this discussion because this is very geography oriented. So I will take this offline, and I hope you don't mind. And uh, uh, so this is this is good. Uh, in terms of also, there's another question in terms of Zen framework, and on the open source side, uh, the various information and experience that we have. I would again like to take this offline because that would be talking specifically about one single framework as against a library that we already have. And the, the, and, and the answers would be towards how to fit our expertise with how Zen would be used, what would be the best framework as against Zen, or if Zen itself is the best framework to use there. Our experience and expertise we can share with you on a separate channel. And for that, I will excuse uh, the rest of the audience. And it's a great question, and that is very close to us because we use a lot of open source frameworks. So we will, of course, take that. And yes, I mean, there's another question which is about Node.js framework. Again, uh, the Node.js framework, the MongoDB, the RabbitMQ, there are various technologies that we have used in the past uh, for various successful implementations, and they're, they're great case studies. And uh, I'm sure you will appreciate if we are able to give you a one-to-one -one and detail, in, this, and detail in, in detail. And you will appreciate the fact that this is not a small question to have a small discussion to have. Node.js itself is a pretty vast topic in terms of what the utility of that technology is in, in, in various server to cloud and various such um, architecture solutions. So on this note, I would like to close today's webinar. And once again, thank you very much for your enthusiastic response. We appreciate you having joined us today. And please uh, do expect to hear from us in terms of a thank you note as well as We'll be sharing a common set of questions and answers that we thought were the best that we could provide you with. And I will connect with you directly for the questions on Zen, as well as Node.js and India-based successes, etc. And uh, write to you separately and connect with you. At the same time, I would encourage you to please visit us on harbingersystems.com. The website is coming up on your screens. This is our website. It would be great if you could have a look. We are a great bunch of people, and we would appreciate your time uh, spent on our website, too. Thank you very much, guys, and have a wonderful day ahead. Uh, this is Amit, Umesh, Subodh, Raji signing off. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.